message today, why are you just standing around? Um, well, <laughs> that's that's uh, passage comes from a couple of uh, a couple of instances in the Gospel of Luke and in the Book of Acts that um, that remind us that there's stuff we have to do. I think uh, when I reflect upon the first disciples in the presence of Jesus. I think about this idea when when what you know is too much. There's um, there's been a couple of movies in the past, you know, the man who knew too much. One of them I think was uh, was a Steve Martin comedy. Another one was uh, an old uh, um, movie noir, black and white um, crime movie of some sort. But uh, here, here's here's the problem. When you, what you know is too much. It's not about too much knowledge. It's about too much having too much to understand, too much to deal with. When what you know is too much about the mysteries and not enough about the reasons, you just might get stuck. You might freeze, or you might go catatonic, or get really useless, or focused on the wrong things. Uh, there's there becomes an overload of disbelief that overrules the acts of faith that allowed you to hang in so far. And that happened to the disciples. There was an overload of disbelief in the midst of this overload of faith and miracles trying to sort out Jesus. In the months after the resurrection of Jesus, his disciples knew too much. Um, they they uh, had too much wonder, too much mystery, too much miracle to really process much of any of it. Their faith was drowning in disbelief because the mysteries of the miracles were overwhelming their power to cope. Now, that happens to a lot of us in a lot of situations. Stress just kind of overtakes us and trying to sort out what is true, what is false, and everything else. One of the programs I like to watch on reruns is, is called Mayday, and it's about uh, air, uh, airliner accidents. And so often, a reason that happens for that crash is because their signals are crossed between what the plane is doing and what the instruments are telling them, uh, whatever it might be. And so they're focusing on one thing, trying to take care of it, and something else goes wrong, goes haywire, and they end up uh, as they say, as a pilot uh, uh, with um, a, uh, um, let's see, CFIT, they call it, controlled flight into terrain. Nothing's wrong with the airplane, you just hit the ground. Now, that's that's a case of overwhelm, being overwhelmed. You know too much, too much is coming, too many things on the right and the left and every place else. And so you don't really know what to do with it. Well, Jesus in Luke 24 visited the disciples in Jerusalem after the resurrection and uh, was uh, showing um, was showing, uh, let's see, see where I am here, showing up among them after the other two disciples from Emmaus had visited him on the road. They ran back to Jerusalem to tell all the news, and Jesus came in among them at that time, and and, and they they couldn't quite figure out what was going on. Now, these two disciples that, that invited him into his home in Emmaus, they didn't understand it was Jesus until he broke the bread and said the blessing. Now, back in Jerusalem, they're telling the disciples that are they're still hiding out from the Jews uh, and, and Jesus shows up there. And because of their disbelieving brains, after he materialized in that locked room, he asked for something to eat. He was given a fish. And when he chewed and swallowed and it didn't end up on the floor, but in his stomach, they had to think about that. How did this work? So Jesus wasn't just a phantasm. He's a bodily resurrected human. He's not simply a spirit or a dream. But what do you do with that? The bad news is that they didn't know what to think. They didn't know what to do. This happened at least 
once, way before the crucifixion, Jesus had had taken um, Jesus had taken his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, on a hike into the hills. And when they got to the top, Jesus went a bit away from them, and something totally unexpected and amazing happened, and they didn't know what to do. Well, what had happened was this. It, Jesus needed to expose them to more of who he truly was, to let these guys in on his true nature, to prove to them that he was the answer to all the prophecies about the Messiah. And so we have in Matthew 17, verses 2 to 4, he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And, uh, and behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we're here. If you wish, I'll make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. There's a common reaction to amazement and miracle. Let's build some shrines. Let's commemorate this. Let's, um, let's make a monument. When you don't know what to think, maybe there's something you can do. At least, let's put up some shelters so when this happens again, you guys have your own rooms. Well, building monuments and building shrines and temples is something that we do for ourselves. And we call it our work for the Lord. And it engages our hearts and our minds and our resources. And we have our ideas about how this should look and how it should come out and everything else. But Jesus wanted to let them know it was not about the place. It was about him. So it's not quite the end of the story of the transfiguration of Matthew's gospel. Because God decides to interrupt Peter's plan of action with his undeniable glory. And what we have in verses 17, 5, and 6 um, is, uh, let me see, did I pop the one over? Okay. 17, 5, and 6, he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, he said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. Well, suddenly they were men who knew too much again, but they didn't know anything about what to think and certainly didn't know what to do. But then we have this, but Jesus came and touched them saying, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they only saw Jesus. They only saw Jesus. Still in shock, still in awe. This is just like what happens when the military brings all its might down with a mighty blow. You just don't know what to do, what to think, where do you turn? But right here, Jesus gave them instruction. Jesus was there with them. And he says this in Matthew 17, 9. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. Oh, well, then if that's the answer, no problem. Yeah. Um, we'll just keep our lips, lips sealed until, until, wait, wait. What did you say? Until the Son of Man is raised from the dead? Um, certainly this wasn't helping very much at this point when they were coming down the mountain. So they changed the subject. And uh, they began to talk about uh, uh, some other things. You know, why, why must Elijah show up? And blah, 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 blah. And Jesus went on and explained some things to them. But, you know, that's what you do. You really get stuck. You just change a subject. You go to something else. Something, you know, something maybe you'd like to talk about or something that'll get your mind off of what you can't quite figure out. But back where we started um, this morning with Jesus appearing to the disciples after the resurrection and eating something in front of them to show that he was real. They didn't know what to think and they didn't know what to do. 
And so the really good news, though, is this is the resurrected Jesus. And Jesus knew what they needed. He knew how to break them out of their stunned state. And so he did some mental transformation in them. Just like in the gospel, um, uh, just like in the revealing of him, his glory, he told them, well, be quiet. You're not ready for this. Here in, in uh, the gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 45 and 46, he touched them, did some transformation of their minds. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead. Oh, they'd heard that before. In fact, they started to put the bricks together. They started to rebuild their understanding. They started to piece together all these things that had overwhelmed them. Well, now at least they might have a chance to know what to think. But what to think isn't the whole answer because they really needed to know what to do. And that's true with us. It's not just about what to think. It's, it's what to do. And so Jesus gave them a purpose and he gave them a goal. And that's important because he took their wonderment and turned it into something they could um, practice. Now, this is still at the end of the Gospel of Luke. So Luke gives, does kind of a recap of, of the last words of Jesus and the ascension at the end of the Gospel before he picks it up again in the book of Acts. Um, and this, this purpose and this goal was here, that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. There's your purpose. There's your goal. Proclaim Jesus. Proclaim that forgiveness of sins would come as following repentance in the name of Jesus. Go. That's your mission. That's your goal. That's your purpose. And, um, but then he told them, but not yet. He told them that uh, you aren't quite ready. You need some time to soak it all in. And you need some help from God to do anything with it. After all, if you guys can't absorb what's going on, how is anybody going to believe your story? You can't quite believe I'm standing right here in front of you. So let it soak for a while and wait for it. Stay in Jerusalem until. Stay in Jerusalem until. He said in, in Luke, the, the precursor to what we're going to look at in Acts, you are witnesses of these things. Luke 24, 48 to 49. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my father upon you. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Well, that's, uh, that's what they did. They didn't know what to think. And they didn't know what to do. But the good news is Jesus gave them a clue. I am sending the Father's promise upon you. But stay until the power shows up. For it is that power that's going to make all the difference. It's going to make the difference between your confusion and your, uh, your questioning turn into something that will be powerful for my name. So that's when he gave them a parting gift to keep them talking until it was time. Well, you know, 
they had to have something to talk about. They had to process between themselves. And the one reason why Jesus didn't just show up to, uh, to only Peter or only John or only James, he showed up to the assembled group so that they might be able to talk about this before them. And he gave them this parting gift that uh, is separated in how it is said between this event and what we see in the first chapter of Acts. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Now, they needed to wait until the gift came upon them. Right now, this little parting gift was a gift of the vision of his glory, the vision of his majesty, the vision that he was more than they had thought about, more than they had talked about. He wasn't just, he wasn't just uh, uh, the, the substitute for an empty tomb. He wasn't just a phantasm showing up. He wasn't just this uh, person who, who managed somehow to do a Star Trek thing way before we ever thought of it, materializing behind the, the locked doors. Um, he was instead someone who physically in their presence could, while he was talking, be brought up in to glory. Uh, and they knew that he could be worshiped. That was his parting gift, a gift of majesty would, that would allow their worship to him, not just absorbing his teaching, but allow his worship. Now, when, when we've encountered a miracle, when we've count, encountered a wonder, when we've encountered things that are more than we can process, more than we can think about, more than we can really understand, something helps with us in that experience. If this has happened before, we, we recognize. If this is something that's been alive in our life before, we, we kind of pick up on it. You know, the very first time that God does something for you that was unexpected, you have no idea it was God until you look back. And probably the second or third time that God does something for you that's totally unexpected, you still don't know it was God until you look back. And then the experience that you have with that as God works in faith in your heart and your mind begins to help you to recognize what's going on in the present as an act and a work of God. Sometimes it still takes us a while, but experience is a great teacher and experience makes a huge difference. Um, time, experience, talking about it, putting things into perspective. Now, as, as uh, Luke goes on to write some more information to um, Theophilus, which is the name given, we don't know if it was a person or simply the title, what those words mean. It means the lover of God, Theophilus, one who loves God. And this, this is the title given, uh, this is written to you in the first uh, chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and it shows up right again in the opening verses of the Acts of the Apostles. So that's why we know it's tied together, that and the, this language style, the vocabulary and everything else. We know that uh, this is still Luke. In the first book of Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Began to do and teach. Now let's talk about how he keeps doing it. <laughs> Um, until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So the command, wait for it. The command, proclaim the gospel. Tell people that through repentance and forgiveness of sins in the, his name, all the nations can find salvation. Those are the commands, but he also said, wait for it. The commands were given through the Holy Spirit. They were given in person, but there was more to happen. For um, something that experience proved was that resurrection was true, and it was proved to be true. It was proved by what uh, 
what Luke had researched, what Luke had shared in his gospel uh, through talking to, uh, imagine this, uh, Luke probably talked to Mary, the mother of Jesus, while Paul was in prison in Jerusalem. And you see, and then in Caesarea for a couple of years. And you see, it's it's all of those times when Luke was gaining information and hearing about this, he talked to the mother of Jesus, the resurrection was true. He talked to the disciples that had seen it, the resurrection was true. He talked to those who had uh, recorded these events, the resurrection was true. It was proven to them through his appearing, through his talking, through his touching, through his eating, and that transporter thing. And, and he gave them some windows into his new nature, able to rise not just from the grave, but also from earth to heaven. He had no more bounds upon him. And uh, uh, what Luke tells to his readers, he presented himself alive to them after suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. After the resurrection, it was now about the kingdom. Before, oh, the kingdom of God showed up, but it was always when the kingdom comes. Now he was talking about the kingdom of God because it was already being put together. That's why we, we believe that the kingdom is a present reality, not just a future hope. Oh, there's a future perfection to the kingdom, but it's a present reality right now in Jesus. And um, he presented to himself by these many proofs. He gave them 40 days of teaching. That's uh, more than a month there. And, uh, and it would happen after 49 days on the 50th day. Pentecost means the 50th day following the Passover. On Pentecost, another week to come after this 40 days of teaching, another week, 10 days uh, after these 40 days of teaching, that um, that something new was going to happen. This time around, he seems to really have their attention. I, I suppose that happens after resurrection, after proof. Re Luke recaps the statements of the gospel, uh, which also included weight um, and this first sign of the ascension, and then the promise of his command is given some additional content as to why. Why wait? Why wait? Well, you need to wait for the promise of the Father. And here is the context that's going to come. It is not just the promise of resurrection, not the promise of the kingdom. It is the promise of the Holy Spirit. While saying while staying to the uh, with them in Acts chapter one, verses four and five, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, "You heard from me." For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. After forty days of teaching, he said, "Wait for it, not yet. It's coming." But it's not long now, because this was all helping them to put this amazing couple of months into some kind of context so that they might be able to process this. Effective witness needs our submission to the Holy Spirit. Effective witness needs us to be in line with God's plan. and and. Just like they did after um, uh, after Jesus ate some fish in front of them, they they tried to sub change the subject. In the gospel, it says that they they asked him if at this time they was going to restore the kingdom, and then they asked him again here in Acts, but but. Uh, Jesus wanted them to not think 
politics, because this was going to be deeper than kingdoms and control and leaders and earthly powers. They had come together, and, and Luke records it. They, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And it's, it's almost like they can't yet put themselves into the purposes of Christ. They still are stuck on their own purposes. Now, that's true with us a lot of times. Usually, well, my, my old country preacher, Alva Hudson, he's, he's the one who told me, uh, don't build the tracks and expect God to run his train on them. <laughs> you know, uh, God, God plows the road in front of us and his Holy Spirit bus goes wherever it will. It's not dependent on the tracks we lay and the expectations we have for what God is going to do. And so don't think politics. They asked if, if the kingdom was going to be restored to Israel. That was one of their goals as zealots, as uh, disciples, as, as um, Hebrews. But what was really important was that they would know that uh, God had a purpose. And it says this, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. Quit asking questions that you don't get the answer to. Well, we, we always like the why questions, right? We always like the, why did this happen? Why, why did it happen to me? God usually says, why not? Um, what makes you so much better than anyone else to whom it's happened to? These, this is the way of humanity. This is the way of living in a world corrupted that will later on be restored. Don't think politics, because God has his own timing as far as the kingdoms you see. He says to them, wait, then witness. Wait, then witness. Wait for what he is going to send. He gave the context. Not so many days from now, the Holy Spirit will baptize you. Then you'll be ready. And here's how he describes it in a verse famous to us, Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that's good news for us. We're hanging out in the ends of the earth when it comes to our relationship to where Jerusalem is, I think. Um, and the witness has come to us over these years. Wait and then witness. Wait for the Holy Spirit because that empowers your witness. I can talk about Jesus all day long. If the Holy Spirit isn't there, nobody really cares to make any changes or get any, uh, get any real faith and belief. The Holy Spirit's necessary to seal the deal. And it's, it's the gift of the evangelist to know exactly when the Holy Spirit has made that connection and you simply ask the question and they respond yes it's because the holy spirit is at work the holy spirit is doing it holy spirit's present in teaching the holy spirit's present in scripture the holy spirit's present in prayer in 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 planning and and thought and all kinds of things the holy spirit is always active but you see these specific gifts it's, it's the person with the gift of healing, we say, which really knows when the Holy Spirit's about to do the deed and puts it all there so it's in the glory of God. Not in our control, but in his control. Which is why we can't just command healing. We can't demand healing. We can respond to God's purpose of healing. And at the right time, for his purposes, he will do the deed. Well, when he said these things, he said, wait. When you get the power, you'll be my witnesses. you go all over the world. And 
when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now you notice this is a slightly different scene than that one at the end of the gospel, because this is at the end of the 40 days of teaching, not just at the end of a, a week or two of showing up among his disciples. After this time, he had already spoken to many. And, uh, and as he was there, he was gone. Disciples still hanging out. A couple showed up and just said, hey, what are you just standing around here for? Why are you just standing around? Well, the, the way the scripture reads is this. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the heaven? This Jesus, this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Why are you just standing around? He gave you, he gave you your instructions. Wait in Jerusalem. Receive the spirit. Be my witnesses. Go all over the world. Let's not build a monument. Let's not, you know, Peter, quit thinking what you're thinking right now. <laughs> I don't know. Peter always, you know, seems to be the one who jumps in too fast. Peter, quit thinking what you're thinking right now. I have other plans. And it's not going to be about a shrine on the Mount of Transfiguration. It's not going to be about a shrine on the Mount of Ascension. It's going to be about the witness of the Savior to the world who so needs to be saved. So don't just, don't just hang out here looking into the sky. Because Jesus is coming back. There's an old uh, bumper sticker from, from, the, from the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, about the time of the Jesus movement. And we had buttons and we had bumper stickers and all this stuff. And it said, Jesus is coming back. Look busy. <laughs> uh, if you don't know what to do, do something anyway. But don't just stand there looking in the clouds. Jesus is coming back. There's things to do. There is our connection with him, our study, our understanding, getting context. If we've just been saved, we're pretty excited about what God has been doing. But you know what? That excitement should still be a light in your heart. That's, it should still be a beacon in your brain. That should still be a motivation for your soul from, from sin to save from death to life, from darkness to light. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another just because our fellowship is with God the Father through his son, Jesus Christ. Let us tell these things so that you also might have fellowship with us. Go and tell this broken world. Jesus is coming back. His Holy Spirit is given to prepare us for witness. His Holy Spirit is given not so we can do acts of power, but so that he can do acts of power. His Holy Spirit is given not so we can be responsible for the gospel, but so that the Holy Spirit is takes charge and is responsible for the pure gospel that saves souls. Not that just convinces people to be good, not that just convinces people is a Jesus is a good teacher. Not that just convinces people that the Bible's a good moral book to follow. But the Holy Spirit convinces people that they need a Savior. And our witness needs to be driven by that Holy Spirit in all that we do. So it, it means we listen. It we, means we act. It means we watch. It means we learn. It means we put things into context. It means we talk together with each other. But we'll always remember, our purpose is not about the shrines or about the temples or about the churches. It's about the people. That Jesus needs us to meet in his name. So that he can be introduced 
and they can be saved. So why are you just standing around? Some we all are guilty of from time to time. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you are the God of presence and grace, power and purpose. You are the God of our days and our eternity. You are the one who loves us so much that your own son was not too great a price to pay so that we might be with you forever. Help us to remember that that love extends to a broken world. Help us to remember that love extends not to just to those that are like us, but to those who are unlike us. Help us to remember that it is your word that makes the difference. It is your son that changes lives. It is the Holy Spirit that gives the power to what we say. So, Father, visit us with your power, with your purpose, with your plan, that we might always, always, always know you and declare your love. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.